All right. Okay. Um. You got my questions here. Okay. Uh, when did you start playing music? I started playing music in high school, at, um, which would be. I graduated from uh, high school in 1965. I was 17, so I was probably playing music by 1962 or three, and in a band, probably by 63, and recording um, demos and stuff before I graduated high school, and then um, it went on from there. You know, by in 1966, you can't. We had a group called the uh, Red Roosters with Ed Cassidy. It was actually a uh, in uh, 1960s before I was. You know? I go way back, you know. Mm hmm. Uh, what were the uh, What were your favorite bands at the time? Did you have any favorites? Initially, me going with the dentals, uh, like surf music hit, but it, it kind of was the, but they were the uh, kind of crude instrumentals, like uh, Torque or Torque, as, as it's really pronounced. And then, of course, Little. Allen's and uh, kind of one of my favorite songs was the um, oh man it, I don't know I'm blocking, blocking it out the, the Battle of New Orleans I oh was that guy but it was a, but but you know I go so it was way before surf music uh, so we were so I was really interested in hearing and stuff. And then this big PRB was this radio station. Uh, actually, uh, GC Top recorded a Texas. They had their own version, but I think it was it might have been even in the right station. But it was just uh, on the Mexican side of the of the border, and they could uh, bust out really amazing rock and roll. Um, and not be constricted by the the, the, the rules of, of the, I guess the uh, CC at that time, and they were doing some really crazy stuff. And I would stay, stay up late at night. Uh, jo oh, Johnny Horton was the guy that did Battle of New Orleans, by the way. Okay. You know, I mean, it was just, it just started with uh, friends turning me on to to records, you know, and uh, rock and roll, old old school rock and roll and then I got to know Barry Hansen who is Dr. Demento and his record collection is famous and he would turn me on to all of this wonderful stuff we lived in a house together ultimately when Spirit was together mm -hmm. and his record collection would attract all kinds of great musicians and it would result in a great interaction and sharing of music and stuff so that's how I kind of got started Okay, and um, what bands were you in before joining Spirit? I think I read something like you had like a brief stint in uh, Canned Heat. Correct, yes. Yeah. Uh, yep. And there was Western Union. We had, I was in a group, that, uh, my group that I was called the Marksman. Um, and then uh, the, the Red Roosters sort of morphed into... Um, Let's see, the Red Rooster morphed into the Western Union, which morphed back into Spirit, or the Spirit's Rebellious. That became Spirit, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and then it went on from Spirit into JoJo Gun, and then Firefall, and Heart, and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you meet the guys in Spirit? I, I actually... Uh, Grew up with Jay Ferguson. We went to junior high school and high school together. And 
Mike Fondelier was also one of our school mates in high school. So we decided to put a band together, which became the uh, Red Roosters. And we wanted to play with Randy Wolf, who became Randy California. Jay, uh, Jay Ferguson's brother, Tom, that had a bluegrass band, said, oh man, I just played with this kid that's awesome. You guys should check him out. And he was playing with his then stepfather, Cass, and he put this uh, kind of folk rock band together called the Red Roosters. And that, so it, it became, we got to know each other partly as childhood friends and friends of childhood friends, and then <clears throat> from there. So it, it was basically kind of a, uh, a school friend kind of a connection initially. Okay. Uh, uh, how did the band get? Uh, how much time span was there in you joining Spirit and then uh, the recording of the first album? It was fairly quick. We we uh, had a. Although we did shop around for a record deal and got turned down by everyone, including Lou Adler. Uh, <laughs> who then, uh, because of our manager, um, Ann Applebush, really bringing Lou's cousin, Marshall Lofty, and uh, I would say from the time I left Canned Heat to the time we got Spirit going, Randy and Cass had left uh, the Los Angeles area, so we stopped the Red Roosters and they went to New York that's where Randy met Jimmy Hendrix who was Jimmy James at that point mm -hmm. and um, had come back so it would be maybe 1956 is when Spirit so I must have been I was only in Canned Heat a brief period of time and then left when Randy and Cass had come back Jay and I reconnected and said let's put a rock band together and we found Randy, and Randy was playing with his stepdad and John Locke and said he'd love to play with us, but he would play with us only if John and Ed were involved. So that's when the, all of the factions sort of merged. So that must have been late. And our first spirit record came out in 1967. Oh. Did you record it in 67? So, that was, that was the, correct. That's the first spirit was recorded. It was released in 68. Huh? I think it was re released in 68. Oh, it was in 67. Okay. Spirit, spirit, the album Spirit was recorded in 1960. Right. Uh, what was, like, the overall... Uh, reception from the debut album like like what were the reviews they were I don't know Rolling Stone gave it kind of a mediocre review um, it was not an instantaneous hit the first single we did we, our, our game plan was no game plan we, uh, Lou Adler decided in his ultimate wisdom that, oh, let's just wait and see what the radio stations pick. Meanwhile, he's putting on Monterey Pop, he's doing all this stuff, and, you know, Spirit is kind of, we're flying out on weekends, doing the fly-in dates, and Mechanical World, which is not the most uh, commercial-sounding <laughs> thing, song, comes out, and, and it breaks out in Miami, Florida. So uh, we go to Florida, and Spirit really broke out of Miami. Um, played a great club called Promoter back then. <clears throat> the underground scene was was completely over the top. We had great success. I mean, it was just really, really uh, amazing. The problem with our initial 
releases was that, that, that it was they, they were regional. They would break out in one place and and, and uh, Salt Lake. We would <clears throat> we were very happening, but it did not happen simultaneously. Had we had a real coordinated PR um, kind of a street team approach in that era, <clears throat> things could have turned out differently. As it was, the reviews were kind of lukewarm. Only the, the only people that were excited about Spirits music, it seemed, were the musicians, and uh, it was just they were underrated and not very uh, acclaimed. No, not much um, uh, commercial success at all. And I think ultimately that's what really was kind of well it, it, that's not why Jay and I left we, we left because of a real conflict within the band but ultimately I think that's what really cratered the band was uh, commercial acceptance we had moments of success but it was never sustained or happened on a national level as pockets. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you, the musicians really, it was excellent. It was very influential and very Hello, Mark. Are you still there? Yeah. It keeps cutting off for some reason. I... Oh, I, I, yeah. It's raining here in Texas, which is <laughs> a good thing. But okay. Awesome. All right. Um... I, but did you get the point that it was we were underrated, but yet influential at the same time? That was that was the point I was making at that moment. Okay. All right. I got it. Um. Now, at the time of, if I can get this right, then the time of uh, the release of the first album, Spirit went on tour with Led Zeppelin, right? Yeah, we did some shows together, and then we wound up. We did. I wouldn't say we went on tour with them, but okay. we did many. We did several shows together, and then we wound up going to England, and uh, Robert Plant would come hang out at the shows and stuff. Cool. Is it true that they played uh, Fresh Garbage during their uh, soundtrack? That's what I hear. I have not. I've had people uh, say that they would get me the uh, a live recording of that, but I've never heard it. But yes, and of course the famous uh, as Randy's little instrumental Taurus. That was my next question. <laughs> yeah, it's of course. What's your opinion on the whole debate with Taurus and uh, Stairway? Jay was uh, incorporated the, the ideas and used that little descending melodic thing. And that was, I mean, there's no disputing back to perfectly, and there's no disputing the fact we were that idea before they did. So. We, it never occurred to us to, you know, bring a lawsuit and, you know, accuse plagiarism, but because everybody was sharing ideas. But if you go back and check it out, it's definitely, a, a, they definitely nicked it. And um, I don't know if, if uh, Randy would be so generous He's now. <laughs> because he really checked out, he docked it. He was... It was not, he, it was spirit, it, you know, he had really put his heart and soul into keeping the thing going and keeping the name out there and releasing records. And it never really, um, it just kind of barely kept him above water. And I, his heart, I think it was a thing for Randy to be acknowledged as for a talent that, that, that he really actually was, you know. 
Okay. Yeah, because I think he did give like some, like in the liner notes for the reissue of the debut album, he did say that he's always he always got asked that that they always that both Tars and Stairway sound alike. That it was in the liner notes for the. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I know which, but that is from the. Yeah, so what did he say? Uh, he always got asked it, and then there was something I read that he said shortly before he died, something like he wasn't too happy about it or something. Oh, really? Well, I would think that the longer it went on and the success eluded him, you know, it probably did mess with him a little bit, but maybe more than a little, you know? But, you know, it was just the intro to the song, but it actually it was this whole first verse, wasn't it? It was really yeah. kind of a big deal, really. Well, Led Zeppelin are, well, Led Zeppelin are one of those bands that, if you go on YouTube, you, you always see these videos that, you know, they're one of those bands that always get played, that always get blamed for plagiarism. There's like a bunch of videos saying like, oh, they plagiarized this blues song and this song and this one. And uh, it doesn't really bother me, but the spirit one. I agree. The... It, it, it's part of, you know, rock and roll. Everybody's, you know, assimilating everybody else's stuff. They're just, it, it's at a certain point, it becomes plagiarism, but um, more than, more often than not, it, it, it's just ideas circulating like in a big, you know, like a system, you know. Uh, the, the, uh, there wasn't too, from what I'm reading, there wasn't too much of a time span between the release of the first album and the recording of, uh, The Family That Plays Together. Yeah, I think that was, was probably close. We, we didn't take much time between. Mm-hmm. So, um... You're probably right. I, I thought went together, and, and Spirit never really toured for long periods of time. We, we would go out on weekends, and you know, two and three days at a time. It was not really uh, very well organized um, project. We just sort of went out when, when you know, whenever we could, and, and would come back. We'd fly commercially. It was just a very kind of haphazard sort of deal. Had we had management, if, if Lou really had um, guided us and really been a proper manager, things might have turned out a little more uh, successful for everyone. Mm -hmm. But then for that album, you did get a hit with uh, I Got a Line on You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the, it was the, the biggest hit spirit ever had, you know, mm -hmm. and that was Randy really, really trying to write ahead too. I mean, he, that was, yep, yeah, you're right. Uh, curious about one song off of uh, The Family That Plays Together. What's the story behind the track uh, Jewish? Randy, who is very Jewish, <laughs> just, he, uh, this is a song in Hebrew, it's part of the, uh, it's I think it's the Passover service. It's, but it's it's the actual text from a, a religious uh, holiday, and just uh, made up the music. And we had so much fun playing that it was great. Yeah, I ask about it because when I was listening to it, I just sort of got a kick out of it because my dad's side of the family is Jewish. So. There you go. Yeah, it's yeah. proper. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, now, by the time that Spirit had released Clear, was the band asked to perform uh, at Woodstock? We were actually on the road and would have loved to have played Woodstock, but we thought, oh, I mean, we being 
our management, Lou, decided that, oh, it wouldn't, you know, be right. But nobody knew what the Woodstock would turn into this iconic event. But we were actually in New, in Connecticut at that time, and uh, it would have been awesome. We we didn't play Monterey, which I find kind of ironic because uh, Lou put that together, and we didn't play Woodstock, which I I can sort of understand, you know, the, maybe the, the logistics of that not coming together, but. In any case, we did not do Woodstock. We did, however, do a bunch of wonderful uh, pop festivals, you know, including Atlanta and uh, West Palm Beach and you know, Devonshire Dad. We did uh, Newport, uh, the Newport Pop Festival and stuff. So it was, they were, it was a big, they were big events, you know, lots of big events. We did not play Woodstock. Mm-hmm. It's kind of. I never thought that you know maybe you could have played at uh, Monterey because Lou was because people who were also organizing Monterey were also uh, John Phillips and the people from the Mamas and the Papas who Lou was producing as well. I think. Correct. Which is why we thought we could have played there. Right. Uh, what was the recording for uh, Twelve Dreams like? Well, it was the one and only album we did with Dave Briggs, and it it really was Randy's masterwork. I mean, he really uh, David had the ability to make my feel really uh, comfortable we David and um, most of the band lived in Topanga Canyon and John Locke uh, was friends with David and put got this whole thing going and I think David really uh, made Randy feel comfortable in the studio Jay and I felt a little uh, maybe a little separated from the project um, uh, and thought that maybe the end result early on anyway was maybe overproduced and a little slick. But as in retrospect, of course, it's it's Spirit's masterpiece record. But I would also say that it was uh, a lot of it was David Briggs helping Randy just really, really express. And during that time, Randy was hurt badly in the horse. Uh, he fell off a horse and fractured his skull, and it was a difficult recovery. We were all doing a lot of drugs, and it was it was not such a I don't know a very easy time. And I think it was the beginning of the realization that I had that you know these behavior was a little erratic and things were just not going well and I should maybe move on in retrospect however I look at that record and I go oh that this is brilliant shit if we had um, had better communicating skills and had maybe intervened and had a, maybe had an intervention and, and really um, reach such a randy, things could have been different, and uh, but things turned out the way they did. And again, that once again, the record was underrated. Rolling Stone never loved this record. I mean, we never got a good review from uh, that publication. And you know, certain people loved it, mainly you know musicians and stuff, but not the the. Uh, mainstream press yeah it is a really it's a really good record yeah it got that's what got me into the music at first <laughs> just found the record for like a dollar at a record store yeah it's a wonderful concept record yeah. and, and it, it really it, it, it retains all the great spirit qualities with, with the uh, 
a great sense of humor, really great songs. You can tell who's writing what's on Randy and Jay. It just really was a, ultimately it wound up being a very, very wonderful record. And uh, unfortunately it was actually the end of the group. Mm -hmm. Now around that time, Randy, I think left the band and then you and Jay went off to form Jojo Gunn. Right. How did forming a Jojo Gun come about? Well, I just mentioned it that this, you know, after that, decided to not go to. And he, the last, not to. And I, I, this is good. I, I can't really be controlled over somebody that's going to just be so unstable. And I told Jay here, and he said, well, wait, let's, I want to work with you, let's do something together. And uh, we stuck around and we started working on thing together, the Jojo Gun concept, which is a more rock oriented kind of thing, which wound up having my brother in it and uh, Curly Smith. And uh, I, uh, yeah, that I only lasted in that. We I put, we put they lived. Uh, Curly and Matt lived at my house. I put the, we put the band together. It was like uh, really labor intensive, lots and lots of time. And they, and I got fired during the first tour because they didn't <laughs> like my girlfriend. <laughs> so Spinal Tap, and I'll tell you, it was just a classic classic spinal tap moment and um but that's the truth and i went i left after that very first record so so jojo kind of winds up to my mind a one hit wonder kind of blip on my radar you know yeah from what i read you were only on that first album and then the other well there was a reunion album a few years back right big chain yeah mm -hmm. but that was odd as well it was almost as odd as the first record, really. Okay. Uh, there were several times that you rejoined Spirit. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. After, well, Randy and I remained very, very close, uh, despite the fact that that's why I left the group was Randy's instability, but. Uh, when Rand really, really had some emotional troubles, uh, his mother called me, and I just realized that Randy was suffering. He was uh, had uh, issues, and, and so he and I remained close, 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 and uh, we worked on farther along. Matt came in and uh, did farther on uh, that record. And, and over the years, yeah, we did a lot of different things. I mean, we did. I wanted Randy to do to uh, do a solo record, and I went. Um, anyway, it, I, I really wanted to encourage him to to be step beyond spirit and, and really start to just to be. And I said, "Oh, record," and he couldn't for some reason. He felt tethered to the whole spirit thing. I think maybe his relationship with Cass or that thing, but um, he couldn't really cut loose of, of spirit, and I think it was really difficult for him ultimately. You know, the pressure that, you know, he felt, and, it, and this guy was a young child prodigy that had the weight of making a living for the family on his shoulders and having the it's a spirit that you know, this guy was a young, strong, vital guy, but I think he just got beat up by having the responsibility of this thing. But anyway, he could not cut loose of spirit, but he and I remained close. We worked together and uh, remained very, very close friends until he uh, drowned. Uh, how did you find out that he had uh, passed? I got a phone call from Barry Hanks. Dr. Dr. Demento.
you know. I was actually in California. I was living in New Mexico at the time, but was working on a project in California and found out that he had gone to, to Molokai, Hawaii for the holidays and didn't, didn't come back. And when you say uh, Barry, do you, he was in spirit for a while, wasn't he? No, the Bear, Barry Hansen was the guy that hooked me up with canned heat. He became the disc jockey, Dr. Demento. Or there was another Barry that was in spirit and he somehow had a relation with uh, Frank Zappa. Oh, yeah, that could be. But that's not the same Barry that I'm referring to. Okay. Wow. Uh, how did you uh, get the job to play in uh, Heart? Left uh, Los Angeles and I was rehearsing with a group in a rehearsal studio and I saw some road cases with Howard Lease's uh, a guy was pushing some road cases with oh, yeah name stenciled on them and I said, oh, do you know, you know Howard? And he said, yeah. I said, oh, Tom. I said, hi, because uh, Firefall opened up for Hart in, all over the place, in Japan, all over the place in, in, in the late 70s. And uh, he called me back uh, about a month later and said if I, if I would be interested in joining the band. And I said, yeah, and I, I, I would. And uh, so I met Nancy and Howie and I was I was in the band. So that would that would be nineteen eighty one, late eighty one, early ninety two eighty two. And then you were with them when uh they had sort of their comeback with uh the self titled record and Bad Animals, right? Yes, that's right. I uh, they had just released private audition and it wasn't doing well and they asked Denny Carmasi who was in Montrose and worked with Michael Shanker to join and uh, with Keith Olson produced the record Passion Works and the song that I wrote actually was charted well rock charts and really started the, the comeback and then Don uh, Grierson uh, well, Trudy Green got involved with HK management and actually worked in partnership with HK Howard Kaufman and uh, Ron Nevison produced and we put the heart record together and did bad animals and all of that stuff uh, from 82 to 92 was when I was there we got Grammy nomination charted number one record of these dreams was their own number one single you know and uh, just recently, uh, Hart were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Now, I didn't check. Now, I know that the Hall inducts certain members. Were you, were you one of them? I was not. Denny and I were snubbed righteously, uh -huh. which I find really, really unfortunate. It really, because they cited our accomplishments. They were saying, oh, you know, Hart, the Grammy Award nominating, you know, and uh, number one hits in the 80s. And, they cited our songs and our work, but did not induct us, which I found really kind of to be a drag, really. If they had just said, okay, the original band, and just cited those songs and that their accomplishments, that would be one thing. But to say that Hart during the 80s did all this, all that had all these accolades, and not include Denny and me, I found really, really disturbing, to be honest. Yeah, because you were like, because the whole comeback, I would think that they would at least. Yeah. Uh, Joel Parisman from the CEO of the Hall said, oh, well, we don't think that they were, Mark and Denny were contributed to the legacy, but there was a whole generation or two heard hard during the 80s and went back and rediscovered the original stuff. So to say that Denny and I didn't contribute to the legacy is total bullshit. Mm -hmm. Well, they did the same thing with Rush. They didn't give a nod to the original drummer. 
They just they just got uh, Getty, Alex, and uh, Neil. Right, but you know they try uh, you know, the Van Halen brothers try to do with Sam Hagar, and of yeah. course Sam had Irving Azoff come in and trip out. And then there's the bands like the Chili Peppers that just have everybody. It's to my opinion, it should be inclusive, and to especially if you're going to cite the, the the work that and the accomplishments that. Uh, uh, members, you know, because after after Denny and I left, I mean, Anne and Nancy have we created the success that, that that they have been operating from this platform that they operate from now. They haven't had a record hit record since what these dreams or you know, whatever, mm-hmm. whatever. And the only reason that they're able to do what they're doing is because of the success of that era. Even though they go, oh, we hated the eighties, they. We feel like we were a cover band, but they haven't written any hits. And and Denny and and Howie and I were writing songs that that wound up being the group songs. How can I refuse? And the shell shell mm-hmm. early radio hits, but they were the songs that kept the rock. I mean, they they kind of counterbalanced the Diane Warren, um, you know, ballad songs that and the. Bernie Toppin, Peter Wolf songs that, you know, these dreams, you know what I mean? That, that's, it, 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 anyway, the point is that it was a, it was a, a righteous snub. I mean, it was a, t- a very, very, um, I think deliberate little uh, F you to Denny and me. And I, I really, think that the uh, Wilson sisters and their manager Carol Peters had a lot to do with it yeah they have a really weird thing with inducting you know which pick which members I know when ACDC got inducted they didn't want to include Mark Evans who was the bass player before Cliff Williams well if it's the band doing that that's one thing but if if the hall because Ann at least publicly has said oh Mark and Denny should be in the hall but if and it, but if so if she's saying that you know and it's not just uh, for the press's benefit if she and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame says oh well we understand well, okay you think that they should be in but we don't think they should be that is weird that is trying to mm-hmm. rewrite history in a in a very very uh, lame way and it really. Uh, Pisses me off, actually. Yeah, I still think uh, there's. They just asked uh, recently on Rolling Stone which band should be inducted, and uh, I didn't see I didn't see Spirit on there, but if I were to have oh, a look, I would love Spirit to see Spirit ne- never be inducted. Spirit got a horrible review, although Cameron Crowe's for. Uh, interview was with spirit you know so but the rock and roll hall and and the denny and i were not we were veteran veterans from way back before we joined hard it wasn't like they took some green you know wide-eyed kids and the the brilliance of the wilson sisters took the made us stars it was the the reverse we took this failing rock band after private audition, you know, and, and turned that in, back into a rock band and the Wilson sisters decided to do, uh, you know, what about love and, you know, and put themselves in corsets and blame it on the guys like, Oh, they were, they were so victimized. They, they, it's a, it's a very, I got a bad, bad feeling about this thing, but it's, you know, you can tell that I'm a little, charged up about it just because I've been getting all these emails and Facebook yeah I've seen solutions and all this crap but it's a bullshit thing but it you know that happens a lot to, in this business the, the music business is uh, really brutal and the Anna and Nancy want to be they, and they should own the brand heart I mean that's for sure especially after they, they Anna and Nancy equals Mm-hmm. Uh, 80s because that was a real band, you know. Going back to Spirit, which um, 
What was the last time you got to talk to John and uh, Cass? I spoke with uh, John. It was maybe six months before his passing. I spoke with John a few days before he passed. I said, man, John, that's good. Give, let him rest and then give him a call. And before I came back, he away. Uh, Cass and I were very, very close. Um, I saw it in 2008, 2009, and went by and visited him, posted a nice little picture on Facebook with me giving him a big smooch. And uh, we stayed connected on the phone, and um, I was aware that he had his failing health and it was up until the almost the very end of the last maybe days that he was not touch. We I couldn't he couldn't talk on the phone for the last ten days with him until the very end. Now this is Cass or John? Cass. Yeah. John I hadn't talked to in maybe months before his passing. Mm-hmm. And uh you still talk to J I Still talk to Jay? Yeah, no, not, I haven't talked in quite a while. You know, we're just kind of don't have much in common these days. No, I don't really speak with Jay that much. Yeah, uh, what What do you do now for music? I record. I do sessions if it's something I enjoy. Um, I jam with my friends in Austin. Uh, I used to do music for fun. I have a fun little jam band. It's called 86. Mm -hmm. And I put work with Kenny Cordray and we'll keep But nothing, it's just all fun. It's, I am out of the music business. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, that is all the questions I have Mark uh, thank you for uh, accepting this interview you're in book I, I, I've asked all my questions uh, yeah I know I'm just saying it was fun chatting with you. Are you with Wilkes-Barre, PA? Yes, I am. Very good. I was born in Philadelphia. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I remember reading about that. Yeah, I, I originally lived from uh, New Jersey, like southern Jersey. That nice. was like 20-some uh, minutes from me. Nice. Well, very nice chatting with you, Aaron. Yeah. Very nice chatting with you. Thank you. Take care. Okay, bye.